Welcome to the Badass Direct Sales Mastery Podcast with your direct sales dom, Jenny Bellinger. Badass Direct Sales Mastery is a podcast for rock star direct sales moms who are determined to make their business kick ass. Jenny will share her knowledge of effective sales and recruiting techniques, tips to get what you want from your business, and will interview direct sales professionals and leaders from various companies. The interviews will give insight to how these rock stars got to where they are and where they plan to grow in the future. And now, the direct sales dom, Jenny Bellinger. Welcome back to the Badass Direct Sales Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Bellinger, your direct sales dom, helping you whip your business into shape. Today I have with me, I am so excited to share Robin Keen with you. I have known Robin for about 18 months now. We met for the very first time at a three-day workshop that we were both participating in. And we have connected on so many different levels because we work with a lot of the same kind of people but we work with them in different ways. So let me tell you about Robin Keen. Robin is the founder of The Quitting Culture. She helps women and men get clear on their purpose and identify and quit all the things that get in the way of achieving it. A former music and dance studio owner, mom to four children, and a business coach, Robin knows the impact of unintentional and intentional quitting and how they have an impact on our experience of ourselves and our lives. So Robin loves working with moms and kids who are trying to figure out how they can live their best possible life. And so Robin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jenny. It's so great to be here with you today. I'm excited to talk to you about this topic. Oh, this is a good one. Let me tell you, because This really does feed into the people who, especially the moms who feel like they're running all over and not able to get their network marketing business stuff done, or they feel like they can't really focus on it because they've got so much else going on for their kids and for themselves. So I'm just so excited to dig into this topic with you because you are the expert on quitting and I love it. Yeah. Well, I've got to, you know, I have my experience of growing up with my parents, never letting me quit anything, which was great training for me on some levels on other levels, not such great training. Mm. And then I got to experience the whole thing around quitting with my own four kids, different children wanted different things. And, you know, quitting was an issue for a couple of them, not all of them. And then having a music and dance studio for over 25 years, my goodness, you know, did I get to see kind of the long-term impact of kids that didn't quit and kids that did quit and just seeing what gets set up and how it gets set up was fascinating. Of course, I didn't know that's what I was learning, but I was <laughs> I was watching it all around me. And as the years go by, you're like, oh, there's a pattern. Oh, there's a pattern here too. And look at that pattern, right? Which you can't see when you're in the middle of it, but you can see it once you've got some hindsight. Yeah, Absolutely. So as you've been working with people in this quitting and not quitting culture, let's start with maybe the the parents who are working with kids and how they can help their kids with this, because helping your kids identify what, when it's okay to quit, when it's not okay to quit, what do they, you know, what's their experience? Let's start with that stuff. And then we'll get into the parents doing it. Cause it's easier, I think for us to deal with our kids quitting versus yeah. our quitting or not. Yeah. So the the deal is, Jenny, that kids don't grow up knowing how to complete anything. That's not, that's just, we don't know that. We learn that from our parents and from Mm -hmm. other people. And so, in fact, it's very natural for us as we're growing, as we're human beings to, um, at the beginning of something, right, we love it. We wouldn't have enrolled or, or started the thing if we weren't excited usually, So we start off with a bang, we're excited, we're going. So I'd call that a peak experience, right? But then at some point in any long-term relationship, when you're trying to learn something, when you're in a relationship with somebody, when you're a parent, you hit a point where you don't like it. You're not happy. You're not, not enjoying it for any reason, no reason. It doesn't matter. And then of course, there are times where you're kind of like, meh, it's okay. It's not great. I don't hate it. It's just okay. That's completely normal. But we don't really think about that. And so we might kind of know that for ourselves, but then we become parents and we enroll our child in something with great intentions. And at the beginning, usually they love it and then they don't like it. 
And so as a mom then, or a mom or a dad, you're faced with, okay, now what? Like, am I a terrible mom if I make them keep going? Am I a terrible mom if I let them quit going to this thing? Uh, well, a damned if you do, a damned if you don't, right? Yeah, how, do, how do you know? How do you know what you should do? So what I really am trying to help people understand is that's normal. And when your kids are little, guess what? You get to choose. So I ran into this with my oldest daughter when she was in preschool and I had a baby at the same time. And she, suddenly one day she didn't want to go. And she's like four. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't want to go? Like, you're having a great time. You're having a great time last week. All of a sudden you don't want to go. I thought she was sick, kept her home, but then it kept happening. And I finally asked her teacher, like, what's up? And she said, well, Robin, she's four, but she's super smart. And in fact, you get to choose, is she safe here? And do you value the activity? And if your answer is yes, then you, then you decide she's too young. She can't possibly make up her mind. She can't know what's in it if she quits. Right. So that was my first direct experience as a mom going, oh my gosh, I get to choose. Mm. So what I've learned is it's best if you, as a parent know why you're enrolling your kid in something and what you want them to achieve. Do you want them to learn a skill? And that would be an end point if they learned it and, you, and they don't like it and you're done. Okay. They achieved something or could they go for a six week class, like swimming for six weeks and complete that. And then they're done. And then you get to decide again, what you want to do next. That the, what happens when a child has a success like that is they believe even when they're four or three or seven, I'm good at something. I finished it. Like I, I achieved something as opposed to. When we let our kids quit because we are uncomfortable with their discomfort, right? They're crying, they're complaining. And then we just think, oh my God, I should, we should, this, they don't like it. We should just quit. For a young child, they don't have any idea why they quit. They cried, they whined, and they quit. But the story they tell themselves is later, I wasn't very good at it. I just wasn't good at it. I'm not very good at anything. Actually, I've quit lots of stuff. I just must not be very good. So what I watched in my studio over all those years were that the kids whose parents got that and could stand the crying and the upset, brief, temporary for the most part, and those kids stayed and got results, those kids were good at everything they tried because they had a concept of themselves as being good at stuff. I'm good at that. And the kids that got to quit and kept trying lots of different things and kept quitting because, because it's just natural to want to quit at some point, those kids became the teenagers that I watched become super isolated at home who never wanted to try anything because the story they told themselves was, I'm just not really good at anything. Mm. So to me, the, the implications of this are huge and I work with a lot of grown grownups who have the story of, I was never very good at anything. And so they don't complete stuff. They procrastinate, they put things off, they drop out, they sneak away. As opposed to the entrepreneurs I work with who are highly successful, they have built a habit of success. I'm good at this. I finish what I start. Oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. And, and even just hearing that, just thinking back to my own childhood, piano lessons was something my parents kept signing me up for. Right. And, you know, even looking back now, it was something, you know, that their purpose for me was to get me involved in music. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that they necessarily wanted to ensure that I could play the piano per se, but yeah. what it did do is I can read music. Yeah. But my brain is not wired in such a way that my right hand and my left hand can play the piano <laughs> at the same yeah. time. I can yeah. play one or the other, but it just, no matter how hard I tried. So at some point they did let me stop, but I was 14 before they, before they realized, okay, yeah, no, this really isn't going to work because they watched yeah. me struggle right. and it, my brain just wasn't wired that way. But what I got out of it was I can read music. I can use that skill to go sing, which is something I am good at Ooh, and was able nice. to translate that skill into something else. So, um, I, I think if I were to talk to my parents now, they'd say, yeah, we really wish you had learned how to play the piano. Mm -hmm. But I think they would also recognize that I got the skill of reading music. Right. And how long? So I'm curious, how long were you in piano lessons for, Jenny? From the time I was four until I was 14. Wow. OK, well, that is huge. And kudos to your parents, too, because they they wanted it so badly for you. 
right? Mm -hmm. And and you must have had some measure of success along the way. Oh you yeah, know, yeah. You participated in a re in recitals, or you you know you could do something. There was some level of satisfaction for your parents too in observing you. So good for you for hanging in there. And I love that at fourteen, your parents gave you a choice, yep. right? Because mm -hmm. that's wisdom too. We don't. So to, I see the other side of this as well, which is, and I mentioned it, when we continue to do something that we shouldn't be doing, right? We, it's just not the right thing for us. Like there's wisdom in stopping that thing. No shame here. I'm just not going to do this anymore. Like I gave it a try. I completed, you know, I did it for this long or I learned this much and now I'm out. And unfortunately, my parents and not, I mean, I'm not upset about anything my parents did regarding this, but the, what they instilled in me because they never let me quit was mm. that you don't get to quit. And so as a woman, and I think women have this more than men, we commit to things with good intentions and then realize they're really not good for us. And then we can't quit. And so I'm talking about real, you know, unhealthy relationships from unhealthy relationships to crappy jobs to, you know, I don't know, there are a million things that I've signed up for because I thought it was a good idea. And then I'm like, you know, a day in a week in a year in, and I'm like, oh, wait a second, actually, no. Yeah. So how do you quit? Like I have, I'm on the other side I, of that now, but I wasn't for a long time. I would call myself an overdoer. I just said yes to everything. And then I overdid it all. And then I finally ended up, you know, wanting to slip away and that's not good either. So there are two sides. It's not just your kids should do it until they're 30. No, your kids should do it until they've achieved something. You got to figure out what that is and then involve them in a conversation and teach them how to let go of things and move on to something else that's better for them. Absolutely. And I, and when I think back, you know, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is give the listener a framework for what that looked like, at least in, in my life. Right. So with the yeah. way that looked in my life was my, my parent, I sat down with my mom. I remember it was my mom, not my dad and said, look, I'm just struggling and I'm not like, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do it because I've tried. You've watched me try, you know, I get frustrated with practice every day. You yeah. know, it's, it's hard. I'd rather focus on being choir, doing my bowling and being mm -hmm. color guard. Because yeah. I was going into high school for, yeah. for being color guard. I'd rather take that time and practice these other things, you know, going bowling, singing. I'd rather take this piano time that's frustrating and, and you know, whatever. And so we had that conversation. And so she saw that I was taking something that I learned and putting it in place with choir, putting it in place with you know, going and still utilizing that skill right. in something that I felt more successful in. Right. So it's it's. Right having the intention is what you're looking for is be purposeful in yes. that conversation with your kiddos and knowing, would you say knowing going into it, what you hope they will come yeah. out of it? 100%. And I think that's a, a, a something that is problematic for parents is they sign or we, I can say we, cause I'm a mom, we sign our kids up with good intentions. We're like, Oh, I think they're going to love this. But without like a deadline or a skill that we want them to learn, it's so easy to bail when they're not happy. So if I know, hey, I'm signing you up because my son Tanner played soccer, all of my kids did, except for the youngest one. I'm signing you up for this season of soccer. You're in, right? Five years old, six years old, seven years old, eight years old, whatever. Yes, we're in. Okay, Tanner, what that means is you're part of a team. And so we are going to stay until the season is over. It's 12 weeks or it's 10 weeks and then we're done, but we can't quit until that's over. Okay. Mm -hmm. You understand? Okay, great. Let's do that. So I am clear about what the goal is. He is clear about what the goal is. Now, if he's four, he's not going to know what that means even. So I have to decide, okay, you know, are we going to play a team sport when he's four? Probably not, but maybe, but you know, <laughs> soccer is like three weeks, right? Okay. Maybe we can handle three weeks or six weeks, but I'm being really internally making decision about what it is that we're there for. What are we there for? If we're in gymnastics, maybe I just want my kid to learn how to do a cartwheel. I can ask at the front desk, how long is that going to take? Well, it takes the average kid eight weeks. Okay, great. How long is the, how long am I signed up for? 10 weeks. Okay, great. I think we can do that. But if we go in without knowing what we're up to, the first sign of trouble 
we're out, right? I mean, who mm-hmm. wants to stay when your kid starts complaining? And I think if we just did that much, that would be a major, major help. And then we can, you know, give our kids a high five. Hey, we did it. You learned how to do a cartwheel or, you know, you played for the whole season. And we've had that conversation with three kids playing soccer. We certainly had the conversation of, you can't quit now. There are a bunch of other kids and a coach that counting on you, right? So Mm -hmm. those are important things to learn that too. Absolutely. So now taking that conversation and now let's, let's shift it to these moms who are working in network marketing or direct sales business and also trying to be mom, wife, girlfriend, friend, dutiful daughter, taking care of her parents, Mm -hmm. um, possibly participating in the PTA, PTO, Mm -hmm. you know, all Mm -hmm. these things. How do, how do we now begin to look at what we're saying yes to now to figure out yeah. how, what do we keep and what do we set aside or plan to set aside? Yeah. And I think that is so hard and it's hard because we each come with our own, the way that we grew up, the filter that we look through at the world through. Right. So being my age, <laughs> I grew up with a mom who pretty much, God bless her, taught me how to be a martyr. Like everyone else goes first, you go last. Like if somebody needs something, you jump through every hoop to make sure that they're taken care of. Doesn't matter if you don't sleep tonight. Seriously, it was pretty extreme in a lot of ways. So some of us come with that. Some of us don't come with that, all of that other conversation around, you know, right and wrong and how you should be as a woman in particular. But regardless of that, I think, you know, I finally got wise enough to look at what I would call opportunities that came my way. Can you, can you help with this bake sale? Can you do this? Can you do that? And I finally got to the point where I was like, look, I'm good at this and I enjoy this. So I will say yes to this, but rather than spread myself thin and put myself in places that I don't enjoy and things I don't like doing, I can say, no, there are so many things I can say yes to. I can say no to the things that are just not a great fit for me and starting to notice like, Actually, if you're an introvert, no, you probably don't want to set, stand at a table selling brownies to strangers, right? <laughs> right. But you might, you might be better off making brownies. Maybe that would make you happy. Like just even starting to notice, I like this. I thrive at this. I suck at that. I'm going to say no. Even that little bit would make a big difference. And removing the guilt around saying no. Right? Mm. It's okay. Mm-hmm. If you say no, you can't say yes to everything. Just like you can't make everybody happy. You can't say yes to everything. But then the bigger question for me, Jenny, is, you know, when we've already committed and we recognize, actually, this is a no for me, what am I going to do now? And so our friend Virginia coined it the unspoken broken. You slip away, right? I'm not going to tell you. I'm just not going to show up, which you know, being in Mm -hmm. network marketing too, right? Like, oh yeah, uh, you can't do that. So that's not a great strategy. So, you know, there is a, a a way of going and saying to somebody, Hey, you know what? It, It takes some nerve. It takes some courage to do it, but Hey, you know what? I've noticed that this thing that I said I would do, I, I, it's not working for me. Like I, I can, I keep finding myself not wanting to show up for this. And yet I have an agreement with you and I'm wondering, and the impact on me, the impact for me is I'm hiding out and I'm resentful when I get here. And so I don't want to feel that way. I want to enjoy the time I invest in this group or whatever it is. So I'm wondering if we can negotiate a different arrangement. Can we renegotiate this? And it could be the renegotiation is I'm done. And I'm sorry, but I would rather tell you than slip away. Or it could be, hey, you know what? I signed up for this. I'm not good at it. I'm not going to like it. Can I please get a different job? Can I please make the brownies instead of sell the brownies? Could we do that instead? And you know what? People are so shocked when we do that. I've rarely had anybody say no to me. They're usually like, oh, wow. Thanks for telling me. I had no idea. Yeah. Why don't you make the brownies? That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so refreshing to have somebody actually show up and say what's on their heart and be honest and ask to renegotiate. That's your rare if you can do that. And it ends up being 
so much better. It's so much more legitimate and authentic and it's freeing. It's so freeing when you can just say that. Absolutely. And I, I want to jump back to what you, what you started with first before we talk about the renegotiation, because I do want to uh, yeah. address that too. But just the learning how to say no was <laughs> huge for me, yeah. right? Just learning a way to say no, not just no, because many of us struggle with just saying that word, that word, just that one yeah. word, right? Yeah. And what made, <laughs> yeah. what made saying no easier for me was when I was asked to do something and it didn't fit my plan, my goals, my purpose, or my strengths, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? It didn't fit into my my life in any way, shape, or form. And I had no actual desire to do it, except that I would love to help this person out. Yeah. What helped me say no was saying, you know, hey, I, I just don't have the bandwidth to do that right now. So mm-hmm. I'm going to say no now rather than committing and then not doing what I said I was going to do. Yeah, totally. Right? And mm-hmm. this will give you time to find somebody who does have the bandwidth to help you out. And that is completely fair. That is a fair request. And reasonable people mm-hmm. will say, oh, thank you for telling me. Exactly. Because, because if somebody asking for somebody to do something and believing they're going to only later to discover that they had no intention or maybe that wasn't even the thing. Maybe they just didn't do it. We don't know why they didn't do it. Oh my gosh, what a disappointment. What an upset, right? Mm-hmm. So to, I would rather know right now. Nope. Jenny said she she doesn't have the bandwidth. Okay, I will now move on. Like you said. Right. It's a gift actually to get a no from somebody rather than to get a thinly disguised yes that means no. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. Those maybes or or I'll think about it and then you just never respond back and you completely ghost yeah. them because you feel guilty. That yeah. affects the relationship, right? And so yeah. mm-hmm. just for me, having those words was a life changer because then I was able to start saying no to more things. And unfortunately, the person I started saying more knows you more often than anybody else was actually Virginia. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah, but she can take it, right? Right, exactly. And, yeah. and and she laughed the first couple of times I said it to her because she's just like, oh man, should I have taught you those words? And I was like, yes, yes, you should yeah. <laughs> Good practice. Right. That's true. Actually, that's a great point. Like if you could even practice with somebody, you know, a good friend, just, Hey, ask me a question. I'm going to say no. Yeah. <laughs> Let me practice saying no and just get it out of my system and get used to saying, I'm sorry. Don't have the bandwidth or not even, I'm sorry. I just don't have the bandwidth. You right. don't even have to apologize. If you can just say, I, I don't have the bandwidth. Exactly. You that don't have to anything. apologize for it. Not fitting in. It's okay. Right. So yeah. that, that, that was a huge thing. So now going back to, so somebody has committed to something before they heard this episode <laughs> and now yeah. they're like, okay, renegotiating mm-hmm. what, and, and you already kind of dug into some ways to renegotiate, but how can you, let's dig into figuring out how this fits in or, because it really helps if somebody can understand why they're renegotiating or why they're, why this isn't working for them. Cause sometimes we just go, I don't like this and I don't know why, and they don't take the time to figure it out. So what are some of the things that might be fitting into that? Yeah, well, for me, it's how does it make me feel? Like Mm. this thing that I said yes to, if I am noticing that I'm dreading it, that I'm not looking forward to it, that I have a stomach ache, that I seem to get a headache every time I think about having to go, that I feel awkward, I don't feel like, I feel like I'm not really contributing the way I would like to with my normal attitude or my normal spunk or whatever. Those are all warning signs for me. Like, okay, hang on, Robin, what's actually going on here? What is it? Is it, is it actually something I'm not good at? Or am I actually not enjoying the environment? Or do I just feel stressed and anxious because I don't have the actual time to do it? And it's one more thing. It could be any of those things, any of those things that give me that, that feeling in my gut, like, oh, not this again. Right. Okay. And I used to have Jenny, I used to have the same rule with my piano students. If I, if you thoughts, if you woke me up in the middle of the night, there was a conversation we needed to have because I really only wanted to think about you when you were sitting on the bench. 
<laughs> that right. was my hard and fast rule. And it's the same kind of thing. It's like, what is this thing that's bothering me? I need to sort it out so I can handle it because I don't want to be worrying every Thursday at one o'clock that I've got this commitment that is very unnerving and upsetting on some level to me. I need to sort that out because who wants to have that every week to dread or whatever yeah. it is. So I think it's a matter of noticing how you feel and going, oh, it's just not the right fit or it's just not the right time. And negotiating it is not easy necessarily, but it's necessary because I don't want to spend that much of my week in anticipation of the anticipation yeah. is probably even worse than whatever this thing was I committed to, right? Absolutely. And and I think too, because you said earlier, it takes courage to have that renegotiation conversation. Good. So I want to point out to people, courage does not mean no fear. No. Courage means you have the conversation conversation in spite of yeah. the fear, the trepidation you have about having the conversation. Yeah. Um, and even though you're saying no, most people will respond more favorably to the fact that you actually had the conversation. Thank you for having the conversation. I mean, I've had literally people say thank you to me when I've had to say no to something before because it did give them time to go find the right person and fill that role. Yeah, and I think unfortunately what happens and it's completely normal, but I'm always talking to my clients about this frequently, regularly, all of the role-playing conversation about what could happen when I do this thing it's actually your brain does not know the difference between fantasy and reality. So your brain is hearing you rehearse and worry and regurgitate all these things that could happen. And it feels like they have when they actually haven't. So if I can go in to a conversation with as little stuff in my head <laughs> as possible, like empty my head and don't walk in with assumptions and nervousness, but just openness to hey, you know what? This is what I've noticed. And this is the impact it's having on me. And because of that, I would like to renegotiate the agreement that I have with you to do this thing. Leave it just big, wide open, no expectations of anybody and see what happens. It's usually mirac kind of miraculous. And I've had some nothing short of miraculous conversations. And I'm not talking about brownies at a bake sale. I'm talking about big stuff, right? Like right. big stuff. And having people, just what you said, say, wow. Right. Oh my gosh. Like I had no idea. Wow. Okay. Let me think about that. Let's talk. And that's a miracle if you ask me. So I'm saying miracles can happen in transforming even relationships you have with other people when you're willing to take the time and be courageous enough to say what you need. Absolutely. I mean, it, to be a hundred percent transparent and authentic, I, I had this type of conversation this is how my my ex-husband and I broke up. We renegotiated our re our relationship. We just went, I don't think we're married. Yeah, me neither. Okay. So what does this new relationship look like? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Right? Having to to renegotiate that. So, Robin, thank you so much for sharing this with everybody. And I know that you have some really amazing programs and opportunities out there for people who are trying to learn about these types of things. You've got a podcast so how can people reach out to you to get more information about your quitting culture program? Yeah, thank you, Jenny. So Quit Proof Kids, Q-U-I-T, quitproofkids.com is my website where I talk about these topics for parents. And then Quitting Culture is my website where I kind of talk about all kinds of stuff, especially about accountability and things like that, which is kind of along these lines. So you can find me either place or on The Liberated Life, my podcast, and I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to find out, you know, what's what's going on for you because, um, you know, I do challenges every once in a while too. I, I've done a five day detox your to do list, which is super helpful, and I'm sure I'll run that oh, again. Yeah. I love that challenge. I had so many people do it, and like in a few minutes a day, I say it changed my life, and I'm like, really? So yeah, I, so I, I'll be I'll be doing that one again in Overdoers Anonymous, my Facebook group. Oh yeah. yeah, guys, go join Overdoers Anonymous on Facebook. Make sure that Robin's in the group. And I'm also in the group, people, because I did her very first five-day Facebook challenge. <laughs> and I'm one of those people who reached out to her and said, whoa, this was eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. And it really mm -hmm. did help me begin to, to let some things go 
and yeah. also recognize when I was being asked for things. And so I've gotten much better about that. Now, am I still sometimes committing myself to things every once in a while, but nowhere near at the level I used to. So guys, Go awesome. check out Overdoers Anonymous on yeah, Facebook. That's, that's probably a great place to connect with me and just say hi. If you come into the group, I have to approve you, but just say that you heard this podcast and say hi, and I'll reach back out to you and I'll be running another challenge coming up pretty soon. And I'll probably do the detox your to-do list one again, because that that one really seems to hit home for most of us overdoers, most of us moms and and dads too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Robin, thank you again for being here. I so appreciate you and sharing your knowledge and experience on this. Thanks, Jenny. It was great conversation with you. Great to see you again. Great to see you again. And Badass Crew, you guys know how this goes. Make sure you stay tuned because there's another Badass episode on its way. Thanks for listening to the Badass Direct Sales Mastery Podcast with your direct sales dom, Jenny Bellinger. Why are you waiting to go to BadassDirectSalesMastery.com? Don't make the Dom get her whip. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to share it with another rock star that you know in direct sales after you subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss any future episodes. You can also check out the show notes for links and any contact information mentioned in today's episode. We'll see you next time.